In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering in my time, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I finished the race, I have kept the faith. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we thank you today, God, that we have gathered here in this place with an expectant word from you. Lord Jesus, knowing that where two or more gathered, you are there, and where two or more agree, it shall be done. And so, Father, today we bind Satan from this room, and we ask the Holy Spirit to walk among us, and to touch us, and to change us, to make us different. Father, to change our attitude, and change our heart, and change our ways. But without you, we can do nothing, and with you, th with you all things are possible. In Jesus' name, amen. I love sports. I'm a coach, been a coach most of my life. Teacher, coach basketball, baseball, football on a high school level, middle school level. I love sport. Teaches you a lot about life, in my opinion. Now, unfortunately for me right now, uh, there's a lot of ups and downs because I'm a homer. I'm a Tennessee Titans fan, and that didn't end well yesterday. I'm a University of Memphis fan. That hadn't went the way it was supposed to go. I'm a Grizzlies fan. We're doing pretty good. I'm about to become an Alabama fan so I can win all the time. But right now, I'm struggling being a hometown sports lover. But I do love sports. And obviously, the Apostle Paul loves sports because he talks a lot about them. He especially likes to talk about boxing and wrestling. And he likes to talk about the marathon. And he says, he uses this in the passage that we read today when he's talking about coming to the end of his life, the end of his race. He knows the time of his departure is coming very soon. And it did. This was probably the last book Paul wrote. And he was writing it to his spiritual son, Timothy. And in this passage, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Now, he, he didn't say I beat the opponent up. I'm the undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. I, I've won the match. I've won the fight. He didn't say I won the marathon. He's not talking about being undefeated, but he's talking about the struggle. He struggled through, and he finished. He did not quit. Now, like I said, I love sports, but some of you in here may not. Sports may not matter to you one bit. That's okay, but trust me, you're in a competition. You're in a competition, whether you like sports or whether you don't, because life is a competition. Nearly everything in life is a competition. You see, when you were in school years ago, whether you know it or not, you were actually ranked in your class, weren't you? Someone graduated valedictorian. Maybe that was you. It definitely wasn't me. But somewhere along that way, I was ranked. I remember when I first started teaching, I actually went back and looked at my uh, file. I was able to get back because I was teaching at the school where I graduated from. So I was actually to be able to look at the file to see where I, were, where I was ranked. It wasn't that great, trust me. Of course, you already knew that. Then when you graduate school, you're in competition because you apply to a college and you, uh, there's only so many seats at that college. If you want to go to Yale or Harvard, I think there's like 500 seats or something like that. Let's see. Harvard had 57,786 applicants and they admitted 2,320. You see, you're in competition. You're in competition based upon your GPA from your high school. What was your grade point average? You're in competition based upon your SAT scores or your ACT scores. And you only realize, I think, when you're applying to college that the decisions and the choices you made in the past has now dictated your future. That's sad because we find that's true in life, isn't it? The choices we make in our past dictate where we can go from there. You're not only in competition there, but finally when you get out of college or if you don't go to college, you're in competition for the job. Whether you're applying for a job on Wall Street or Walmart, 
You're in competition. They're going to take your application. They're going to look at your application. They're going to look at the others that have applied for this job, and they're going to compare your application to theirs. They're going to see what you have to offer. They're going to grant you the job or not grant you the job based upon the other applicants that have applied for the job. You're in competition. Once you get the job, you're in competition. Whether or not you uh, get what you're paid on is based upon what your worth is in comparison to the rest of the people that work for the company or the factory or wherever you are. You're able to rise up in the company and be promoted based upon how much better you are than those who work alongside you. You're always in competition. Even who you marry is a competition. Trust me, somebody else wanted that woman. They did. You're in competition. Somebody else wanted her. Somebody else wanted him. And so you competed. Some of us get pretty jealous about that competition, but you're in competition. And then even after you get married, guess what? You're still competing for her or for him, aren't you? Because trust me, one, one, man's, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Somebody's always wanting that woman. Somebody's always wanting that man. Whether or not you believe it or not, you're in competition at all times, even after you've been married. Almost everything in life is based upon competition. And here's the problem. You're not always going to win. You're probably going to lose almost as much as you do win. You will not go undefeated. You're going to fall. You're going to fail. You're not going to get that job. You're not going to get that promotion. You're not going to get that woman. You're not going to get that man. You're not going to get into that college of your choice, maybe. There's going to be times that you are going to be knocked back and knocked down. There's going to be times when it seems like you cannot finish the race. Because the fact is that everyone that sits in this room and every person that ever lived has a common characteristic. They are both winners and they are both losers. Now, when I first got into coaching, I was a young man with hair. And um, I mean, I thought that if I ever stepped on a basketball court or a football field or a baseball diamond, I was going to win because I was there. I was Coach Wallace. And I was just a winner. And so I thought I would always win. And, and sometimes I did. I, I have in my, uh, at my, beside my bed, in my little cabinet there, I have a gold ring. Beautiful, solid gold ring. It says on there, state champions. When I was a coach of baseball at Mumford High School in 1991, we won a state championship. Ranked in the top 10 in USA Today, we were a nationally recognized baseball team. When we hit the field, you could just about bet we were going to win. And we did. Best team in Tennessee by far. Went through the state championship unscathed, undefeated. Won the state championship game with a pitcher that... Struck out the last six batters on 18 pitches. Nobody fouled a ball. Nobody touched it. 18 straight strikes to walk off the field. State championship. We won every single game. When I moved to Millington, they put me in the Millington Middle School basketball team. I just knew coming from Nashville that I would step on that court and win. And I lost every game. Every single game. Not one win. Everybody in this room is both winners and both losers. I constantly put my little fourth through sixth grade classes at Millington in competition. And I put them in competition because I want them to understand the lessons they learn in a physical education class can be applied to all aspects of life. Because when they leave that class... They're going to understand what it's like to win and what it's like to lose because I'm going to put them in situations where they are guaranteed to lose. And I tell them that. I'm going to make you so mad you can't stand it. And do I ever. They rip off jerseys. They throw the jerseys at me. 
They can't stand it when they lose or when they're on a team that they think they're the best at and, and nobody else on their team, teammates are any good. They win and they lose, and I make sure that they do. And they get upset. The other day I had to send two to the office because they were fighting after class. I mean, just pushing each other and shoving each other and taunting each other. And so basically the sermon you're getting this morning is part of the sermon I gave that whole class the next time they came in the gym. You're going to win and you're going to lose. It sounds immature that kids would fight over something like that, but don't we also? Don't we hate to lose when we lose? We want to do like those little kids. We want to accuse others of cheating. Well, the reason he got that promotion is because he knew somebody in the company. When we lose, we want to blame somebody. Well, I wouldn't have done that if he had said that, if, if she hadn't have done that to me. Oh, we want to quit. Stop. I'm not playing anymore. The rules are bit against me. So I don't want to play. So we want to quit. We want to walk out of the job. We want to walk out of the marriage. We want to walk out of the church. The fact is, everybody wants to win. It's easy to win. And it's easy to uh, love life when we're winning. But every single one of us is going to lose sometimes. We will all win and we will all lose. But what separates true character? What separates true even Christianity is tenacity and resilience. And that's what Paul is talking about. You see, life is going to hit you hard. God is going to allow you to be placed in the competition. He's going to allow you to be placed in the struggle. And sometimes it's going to hit us hard. The relationship is going to end. She chose someone else over me. I did not get that job that I so desperately needed and wanted. We did not get into the school of our choice. We didn't make the team. And it's only natural that when we lose or when we fail or when we have a setback, it's only natural that depression and despair and disappointment comes. Trust me, I felt all of those last night. I'm glad you didn't text me last night after the game. Text me before the game. But despair and depression hit me. I threatened to get out of a group a text call with my brother and, his, and my nieces and my daughters and sons. I was like, y'all say one more word and I'm done. I was through with it. I was disappointed. I was depressed. I was uh, in despair. But see, how we respond to these setbacks, how we respond to the losing it's what defines who we really are and what we are really made of. The true mark of our character is how we react to losing. Resilience is a word that I love. Resilience is a word that means the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness. Now, when I think of resilience, I think of Rocky Balboa. He comes to my mind. I, I love all the Rocky movies. They're probably still some of my favorite movies now. I, I probably watched every one of them three or four times at least. I love the Rocky movies. And I think most people do because in that movie you see resilience. You see setbacks. And you see a man that overcomes. Resilience is a picture of that heavyweight boxer, battered and bloodied and bruised, being knocked down, thought to lose all odds against him. But somehow he grabs the rope and he struggles to his feet. And he continues the fight. Where so many others would have just simply quit. Maybe we want to quit. Maybe we just want to lay on the mat for a while. Maybe we just want to throw in the towel. Maybe some of us entered this room today close to quitting. Just too hard. It's too hard to work out this marriage. It's too hard to overcome our addictions. It's, it's too hard. It's too hard. I, I just want to quit my job. I want to give in. I want to move on. But how do you know? That if you can struggle to your feet one more time, how do you know that tomorrow's not the day that you'll get the victory that you always wanted? Won't you give it one more shot? I wonder how many of us quit right before we get to the goal line, not knowing that just, just the next day that we will finally reap the good that we have sowed. 
You see, resilient people always live in hope. I think I like, of all the Rocky movies, I think I like Rocky 1 the best, the very first Rocky. And the reason I like that one is because he lost. I mean, it's set up great for the next two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and, and 12. I mean, all the other Rockies just set it all up for that. But, but that first one was awesome because I expected him to win. I cheered for him to win. But he lost. And it's put such a twist to the movie because you admired a man who lost but never gave up. Resilient people never quit. And you're not dead yet. If God was through with you, you would know it. You know, I've heard people say, as long as there's life, there is hope. But I want to go one step further as a child of God. For the child of God, even when there is no life left, there is still hope. Because God's favorite thing to do is to raise the dead. Another word that comes to mind when I think of a marathon runner or a boxer going all 12 rounds is tenacity. What is tenacity? Tenacity is that mental or moral strength to stand up, up, up under opposition or danger or hardship. It's the endurance under the strain to refuse simply to quit. People with tenacity, they don't quit. We live in a society today of quitters. Of people with no character. At the first sign of a little uh, danger or the first sign of, uh, of a little hardship, we want to quit. If life doesn't break our way, we want to whine and complain. If we don't get what we want, when we want it. We feel like we're entitled people. That somehow the world owes us something. But the world owes you nothing. And let me assure you of this, the world's not going to give you anything. We're going to talk a little bit more about that next week. The world's going to fight against you. And we're not going to like the way the world's turned sometimes. You see, someone once asked a desert father named Abba Anthony, what must one do to please God? And the first two uh, answers to that question were expected. Always be aware of God's presence and always obey God's word. But the third answer to that question was, Wherever you find yourself, do not easily leave. And that's so true. We want to leave when it gets hard. We want to quit when it doesn't break our way. And too often we fail and we quit when success was just one more try away. We must understand that life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not over quickly. There's not going to come that day that you live happily ever after. I'm sorry. That's a good fairy tale. But it just simply doesn't happen that way. God allows the struggle. God allows that. A marathon runner, of which Paul pictured in his imagery here, a marathon is 26 miles. I remember when I was in college at... In Jackson, at Union University, I can remember the Andrew Jackson Marathon that took place there. And I would go out there one day, I had to work that program for a PE extra credit. And so I was out there watching these marathon runners run. And I would watch as they would run their race and as they would pass the finish line, some of them would literally make it to the finish line and they would collapse. And I saw one person taken after he crossed that finish line and was put into the ambulance. I saw others being treated with IVs. And I was like, why in the world would somebody want to go through all that? But a marathon runner describes the race as when you're running, there's many times that you'll hit the wall. That you'll hit the wall. Now, what happens is, according to kinesiology... When you start running at first, you don't breathe. If you were in a sprint. In other words, you start running as fast as you can. You're almost, you're holding your breath. And then after you begin running for a while, then what will happen is your body will begin to burn oxygen. And so you begin to have to take in deep breaths in order to, to run, to continue your running. And then what will happen is after your oxygen cannot keep up with the, the, the demand, su demand supply of your muscles, when that happens, your body will begin to burn fat. That would have a whole lot of 
energy stored up right here. That's why I've been doing this in case I ever want to run a marathon. But the fact is, is that once most of these marathon runners don't have much fat, do they? And so what they do is the body, instead of burning fat, begins to burn muscle. And that's when you hit the wall. When muscle begins to be burned for energy in your body. And when that happens, the body becomes starved for energy, and it literally begins to burn the body tissue. And marathon runners describe that as though something, suddenly they're exhausted, totally fatigued. It's like a punch in the gut. Uh, one runner described it as every step he took when he hit that wall was like someone had took a, a baseball bat and hit him right in the abdomen. A gut punch. He, he struggled along and when asked, well, how did you finish the race and how did you get through that wall? He said, well, as I was running, I would look up and I, he would say, when I get to that stop sign up there, I'm going to quit. Then he would get to that stop sign. He'd say, well, whenever I get to that car up there that's parked, that blue car, then I'm going to quit. Then he would make it to the blue car. Then he would look ahead. He said, well, whenever I get up there to that uh, red light, then I'm going to stop. And yet he would make it to the red light. He kept pushing through and pushing through till finally he saw the finish line. And he said, whenever I get to that finish line, then I'm going to stop. And that's a good example of how we should be as Christians. Never quitting. Tenacity, pushing forward, always, even when the pain wrecks our body, move on, move on. Peter Strudrich was a marathon runner. And as I said, the marathons, they would go 26 miles. He ran countless marathons, but he never won a single race. You see, Peter was born with no right hand. His left hand had only a thumb and one finger. He was born with no feet. His legs ended in stumps. He began seriously running at the age of 39. And this is what Peter said about his marathon races. I have lost every race I have entered, but I will never be a loser. I will be out there running for as many years as I can. And if in my last race the mountain is too steep to run, I will jog. And if I cannot jog, I will walk. And if I cannot walk, I will crawl on all fours. And when I can no longer crawl, I will shout words of fire and glory to those around me. He's never won a race, but he's a winner. You see, we must understand, as I said earlier, that God's found in the struggle. He allows the struggle. For it's in that struggle that we find God and only in that struggle. If you have a concordance, if you know what a concordance is, but if you have one, look in there for the word or the phrase, but God, but God. When these two words come together, it's usually when the situation is helpless and hopeless. In that dark hour, at the seemingly last moment, something takes place. And God changes the circumstances and he changes the situations. God told Abraham that he would have more descendants than the stars in the sky. But he was old and his wife was past childbearing years. People who he told this to would mock him and his own wife laughed when, she, when he told her that they were going to have a son. He tried to manipulate the situation but it didn't work out. It was too, he was too old. But God, but God. Joseph had a dream as a young man that one day he would be a ruler, a great ruler, but he was sold by his brothers into slavery. He was falsely imprisoned, betrayed by a friend who forgot a promise that he had made to him, and spent years in prison. What was the promises that God had given him? Helpless and hopeless in that prison, but God. Moses 
was just a runaway slave living in the desert when God called him to go and begin to deliver the Israelites from the Egyptians. God, I, I'm poor. I don't have anything. And I stutter. And you want me to go before the most powerful man in the world and speak for you? That's impossible. But God... David was just a 12-year-old boy when one day he came upon the Israelite army and a giant in the valley. The Israelite army shivered in fear as Goliath stood in that giant, stood in that valley and called for one man to come battle him. And all the Israelite army, like I said, shivered and shuddered. And, and even though they had a loud battle cry, they were not willing to go meet that giant in that valley. But David said, I will. God who delivered me, my God who delivered me from the, from the jaw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me from the hands of this Philistine who defies our God. Paul, I mean Saul didn't believe it, the king. His brothers told him he's a little boy who needs to go back and shepherd the sheep, just there to watch a fight. There's no way a little boy without any armor or without a shield or without a, without a sword, could beat a Goliath giant in a valley decked out with armor and a, mighty, and a mighty spear and a sword. But yet, David walked down that hill armed with faith and facing impossible odds but God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow. And so they faced a fiery furnace by a king of the most powerful nation of the world who said, if you don't bow, you're going to burn. And they said to this king, whether we burn or whether God chooses to deliver us, we still will not bow. And so Nebuchadnezzar heated up the furnace seven times hotter so the very men who stood there at the furnace's entrance were burned to death. And they threw, they threw Meshach, Abednego, and Shadrach into that fiery furnace. It would be done. It was over. But God. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. She would probably always be a prostitute. But yet Mary Magdalene was the first one that the risen Lord announced his resurrection to. But God. D.L. Moody was an uneducated man. He couldn't put two words of the English language together grammatically correct. Yet D.L. Moody one day said when he heard the sermon is there any person that's ever truly given everything to God? And D.L. Moody said, by the grace of God, I will be that man. And this man who was uneducated, this man who could not put two words of the English language together, grammatically correct, shook two continents for Christ. Why? But God. John Newton was a slave boat captain who wrote Amazing Grace. But God, they beat him, beat him almost to death, forced him to carry his own cross up the hill called Calvary with a thorn of crowns upon his head, stripped naked before the multitude to see, with nails in his hands and in his feet, his friends fled. And it looked hopeless as this one, this man who once called himself the Messiah now hung limp and dying in the rain. They took his lifeless body down and they lay it in a borrowed tomb and they sealed the tomb and they said it's over. But God, he was a drunk, an adulterer, a liar, and a hypocrite. His friends wouldn't hardly speak to him. 
he had come to a point of realizing that his life was over. Tried to drink himself to death. He had had his chance and he had blew it. His wife had left him and he sat alone, utterly alone in a camper in Nashville. And everybody counted him out. But I'm standing here today because but God. But God. Some of you out there, you think you've went too far. You've done too much. You don't have an education. You don't have the gifts that it takes. But God. Some of you think your marriage is over. You've always already counted it out. But God, some of you think, uh, I'm too broke, uh, I'm too dumb, I, I can't go to school, I, I can't change my destiny, but God. Some of you think, I've been abused and used, I'm an addict and I can't go one day without my fix. But God, God is the lover of those who do not quit. God is the lover of those who rise up. God is the lover of those who show resilience and tenacity and fight through the pain and continue on even when every nerve in their body screams, quit, stop. Do you not realize where that voice is coming from? Telling you to quit? Telling you to stop? We serve a Savior today, a Lord today that is a miracle worker, a promise keeper. Our God is God. And to me, the greatest miracles that happen today are not somehow an earthquake or some supernatural thing that happens on planet Earth. The greatest miracles I see today are reformed and changed lives from people who did not quit and who gave it and surrendered it all to God. And God changed the course of their life and their destiny. And I'm looking at some of you here today that God's done that with. Praise God. So if today... You feel like quitting? You feel like giving up? You feel sorry for yourself? You're disappointed? You're downtrodden? You're heartbroken? Just remember, but God, I have finished the course. I've kept the faith. And I have fought the good fight. Let's all stand.